Repressing the urge to burst into song, you choose instead to quietly admire the area. Greetings again, merchant. Yes, many greetings. Need you have now for my wares of great specialty? What wares do you sell, good merchant? For yourself, behold them. You look over the merchant's wares of great specialty and quickly reevaluate them as junk. You seem to have quite a selection of, well, quite a selection. A keen eye have you. In an item or two, provoke interest, I might? A daunting task. Uh, uh, rather, by all means. This I have. You appraise the object he holds up to you. It is a simple shell, intricately fashioned into the shape of a comb. The workmanship is unlike anything you have ever seen. Fascinating. Where did you find such a thing? Oh, old it is. From ancient times descends. Valuable, without question. Royal property, former, to be sure. You consider his story. Then you begin wondering which beach he found it on. Repressing the urge to burst. Repressing. If I were to, say, purchase the shell, what would it cost? A trifle would you expend. Seven golds. I fear that I did not bring any money. Curiosity, I find, in one who travels but with nothing to barter brings. Good point. Is this yours? Ah, keen eyes you have. For that, a reward shall you receive. And that would be? The pleasure you will have in doing business with me. Repress, repress. Might you trade the shell comb for something? The merchant ponders over this for a moment. Of value, many things are. Of fancy, only one I have. And that is? Pearls. Would you be interested in this pearl? Indeed, I would. In return, the shell I present to you. May you be always groomed well. The merchant grabs the pearl and tosses the shell comb to you. Then he saunters off. History will decide how greatly you were just swindled. Oh, what a beauty. This will be worth a fortune back home. This horse must have skipped lunch. Yes? Could you recommend another good book? There! This book is entitled, Way Below Your League, A Look at Sentient Aquatic Life. Browsing through it, you notice an interesting excerpt.
There's nothing you could pop. There's n You take the basket. You hand the basket to Possum. Thank you, kind sir. Please take this flower. I'm afraid it's all I have to give you. It is more than enough. I notice that you have picked only yellow flowers. Of course. Is it not customary for one to pick yellow flowers for another who is gravely ill? Certainly it is. I'm sorry to hear about your grandma, Possum. Thank you. Goodbye. The fallen picket feels reasonably sturdy and is pointed at one end. Believing that you may find a use for it, you retrieve it and carry it with you. A mermaid basks on a nearby rock. Her long flowing hair extends over most of her upper body. The green scales on her lower body sparkle as she basks in the sun. You hold out the shell comb in your hand. Clear recognition shines from the mermaid's delicate features. She hesitates a moment, then cautiously extends her arm, hands open expectantly. You gently place the shell comb in her palm. The mermaid examines it and smiles. She removes an opal necklace from around her neck and hands it to you. After a moment of admiring her once lost possession, she looks at you with anticipation. You attempt to charade the act of going underwater to the mermaid. She regards you with a look of puzzlement. Just when the whole demonstration becomes too embarrassing to continue, she suddenly dives into the sea and swims right up to you. After giving you a rather intense kiss, the mermaid dies under the water again. You wonder where she has disappeared to. Then suddenly, you feel a pulling at your legs. The mermaid holds on to you, keeping you from resurfacing. You struggle instinctively while trying to hold your breath, but she will not let go. You know you are going to black out soon. Wait a minute, you're still breathing. How can this be? Could it have been the mermaid's kiss? Speaking of which, where has she gone to this time? You are under the sea. Amazingly, you're still able to breathe. A seahorse bobs in the current, awaiting you to mount his saddle. Well, this is a new experience. The seahorse willingly allows you to climb upon its back. You slide into the little saddle and take up the reins in your hands. You just hope this creature knows where it is taking you. After a time of traveling through ever-deepening water, you arrive at a massive stone archway. Passing through it, you notice it is covered with many different intricate symbols none of which you recognize. Mer writing, perhaps? As you emerge on the other side of the arch, a grand sight greets your eyes.
You have entered an aquatic throne room. As one would expect, such a place has a throne of sorts. But what you see seated in it takes your breath away, if that still applies. It is unmistakably the ruler of the Mer people, the king of this watery world, known by many names. Neptune is the one by which he is best known to your kind. King Neptune is tall and imposing and has a long gray beard. A crown fashioned of an unknown metal adorns his head. You bow before the king. He returns the gesture with a lowering of his own head. You open your mouth to speak, but only a bubble emerges. It begins floating up to the surface. You watch as your air bubble divides in two. Incredibly, each half maintains its semi-spherical shape. You take the half bubbles in your hands and position them respectively near your mouth and ear. A deep, elegant voice instantly booms from them. You are welcome here, human. Thank you. I am King Graham of Daventry. Your courtesy depicts your stature. What is it you seek here? You explain that you are seeking the three gems of nature and that you believe one of them to be somewhere in this realm. You demonstrate the approximate size and shape of the gem, then mention the door of destiny and what you hope to find on the other side. Hmm, I do have that which you are seeking and know of the door of destiny. It is very old. Its origin is known to but a few. What I possess was known to the ancients as the birth gem. In the realm of the Mer people, it is called the water gem, for without water, life cannot begin. Might I have this gem, your majesty? I shall let you have the gem, but first I must ask you to earn it by way of performing a service for me. You are about to say anything. But then remember what you heard the last time you said that word to the stone door. Instead, you just nod and allow Neptune to continue. My trident, the symbol of my power and the strength of my people, has been stolen. A faint mumbling can be heard through the ear half of your bubble. This event is obviously of concern to those in attendance. It is believed that one of our allies and neighbors have taken advantage of the Mer people's kindness and that their own king now has possession of the trident. If you can reclaim it in the name of the Mer people, I will grant you ownership of the water gem. Will you do this, King Grim? The murmuring has stopped. All are awaiting your response. I would be honored to reclaim your trident, your majesty. My sentries will escort you to the border between our two kingdoms. You may continue to use that steed to hasten your journey. It is my best. My sincerest hopes that you do not fall victim to the Shaggies. As you prepare yourself for this new quest, a sudden pang of apprehension seizes you. Did the king just say sharkies, as in sharks? Your majesty, is there anything you can tell me about the sharkies? They are large, fierce, and carnivorous. Anything else? They are always hungry. Anything that might be of benefit? Like something to help you live longer? I do recall that they have poorer vision than we Mer people do as they dwell in the darker waters. So I might have a chance were I to encounter one. You can always hope. That was not inspiring. Why was your trident stolen? That is a matter of great concern to me. Should the Shaki King determine the trident's nature, he would assuredly bring about the deaths of countless Mer people. I shall return as soon as I am able, Your Majesty. Good luck. As you depart the underwater kingdom, you see two guards waiting to escort you to the Sharky's realm.
The sentries swiftly guide you along the bottom of the seabed, descending into much darker, colder water. After keeping pace with them for what seems like an eternity, you notice a forebodingly dark area looming closer and closer. You have arrived at the border of the Sharky's Kingdom. This is as far as the sentries will take you. One of the guards salutes you, then they both head back to the safety of their own waters. You're on your own from here, Graham. Those guards were sure in a big hurry to get out of here. This underwater realm belongs to the Sharkies. The water drops noticeably in temperature as you progress further into it. There are bound to be sentries on patrol around here, so you remind yourself to be alert. Debris from a wrecked vessel lies strewn and half-buried on the seabed. Seeing no remains of the crew, you wonder if they were eaten before or after they drowned. You need to get closer. Examining the heavily waterlogged remnants of the vessel, you notice an old antique bottle half-buried in the sand. With great difficulty, you lean over in your saddle and manage to scoop it up. You remove the cloth from the bottle. It appears to be another part of the rock wall. It appears to be another part of the rock wall. This underwater realm belongs to the Sharkies. The water drops noticeably in temperature as you progress further into it. There are bound to be sentries on patrol around here, so you remind yourself to be alert. The western wall is but an illusion. You easily pass through it into a series of caves and tunnels on the other side. It's pitch black in here. You cannot see a thing. You'll need to find some sort of light source before you are able to proceed. It's pitch black in here. You cannot see a thing. These small, luminescent fish are feeding on a strange-looking plant. There is nothing of interest lying on the seabed, and you are not here to collect shells or coral. There is no You lean over and pick some of the grass, which grows in between the rocks. You stuff the sugary grass into the empty bottle and push it all the way to the bottom.
You place the baited bottle on the seabed, close to the luminescent fish. A few of the glowing fish are now swimming around inside the bottle. You take the bottle. A large opaque shell seemingly blocks a tunnel to the north. Whatever lies in that direction must be very important. You slide your blade through a small gap in the door and pull with all your might. It is difficult handling your weapon underwater and you realize that combat will not be an option. So if it ever comes to that, you're in big trouble. As you open the door, ample light floods into the underwater cave, and you are now able to make your way around without the glowing fish. Oh no, the seahorse has followed you. Let's hope it doesn't give your presence away. You are safely concealed behind the remnants of a stone archway. This is fortunate, as the king of the Sharkies is also here. Aside from his menacing appearance, he also seems to be in a very bad mood. I do not understand it. It should work for me. Is it not written the trident's power can only be wielded by those of goodwill? Well, is it not? The king's aides nod fervently. And do I not possess the greatest will in this kingdom? No one can best me in battle. My resolve is unshakable. No amount of bleeding can dissuade me from slaughtering my enemies. Does this not signify that my will is the best there is? The Sharky King's aides seem all too willing to agree. Then why does it not work? You watch carefully as the Sharky King taps four shells in order around the arch. It matters not. Tomorrow we invade the Mer People's territory. For without the trident's power, that old fool Neptune and his weakling followers will fall before our might. Goodwill. Ha! Mine is superior to all. As he leaves, the Sharky King motions for his guards to remain.
The Sharky guards are menacing in appearance, and you imagine they could do you a fair amount of damage if they were so inclined, and you believe they are. Having an idea, you approach your somewhat reluctant steed and slap him hard on the back. Look at him go. The guards are momentarily distracted. Now is your chance. You push on the shell. It moves back slightly into the wall. The trident is rusty and corroded. It looks something like a pitchfork. Despite yourself, you cannot help but marvel at the treasure. It must have been collected or stolen over many years, and as such, there are coins and jewels originating from all over the world. Without delay, you snatch up the trident before the guards return to their posts. It appears as if the guards are losing interest in the seahorse. You had better get out of here quickly. Oh no, the seahorse has followed you all the way back to the secret entrance. The guards are sure to discover you now. You remount the seahorse. Your seahorse glides onward, flicking its little tail faster than ever. You grip the reins tightly, glancing nervously over your shoulder every so often to check for pursuing sentries. As you make distance, your anxiety melts into relief. But it is to be short-lived. Finally, you see the light at the end of the tunnel. You quickly make a dash for the exit. As you emerge, you realize you have only seconds before the guards come out after you. And even if you could outrun them, you're sure the commotion would attract the sentry's attention. Then you'd be in real trouble. Suddenly, you hear a strange voice in your head. He of noble and goodwill. Royal Trident thou may wield. You wonder what that did, if anything at all.
the trident guides you back to Neptune's realm. You approach the king. He smiles and graciously accepts his trident from you. Then he calls everyone to attention. To commemorate the return of my trident and to honor King Graham's success, I hereby call for a celebration. The celebration lasts for some time. You eat, drink, and have a merry time with many of the Mer people. After a few hours, the festivities wind down, and you finally have a chance to speak with Neptune alone. The terms of nature represent the three stages of life. Water gives birth to life, and thus what I have given you is the first of three. Second is the growth gem, or air gem for air sustains life and permits it to grow. How might I find the growth gem? I know only that its location is as far above the surface of the land as we are below it. Beyond that, I cannot aid you. A smirk crosses Neptune's face momentarily. You might say that air is not exactly my element. You decide that the beverages consumed were to blame for that one. And the third gem, Your Majesty? Third is the death gem. The completion of life and the natural order of things. The ore of destiny understands this now, as did the ancients who imprisoned the soul within. As for that gem's location, I had hoped you would have no business venturing to the castle. Kalima was once ruled from that place, but sadly her people have not seen their lord for quite some time. But if you please, I would prefer not to dwell upon this subject. You have done me a great service this day, and I thank you. Good luck, King Graham, and good speed. You depart the underwater kingdom and head back towards the surface. What an incredible experience. You are certain you'll never forget the adventure you just had. Additionally, you have acquired one of the gems. As you resurface, you realize that the magic which allowed you to breathe underwater has now subsided. It is a slightly luminescent blue stone about the size of your palm.